We have more reports with the Chicago Bulls still looking to trade up to possibly draft Donovan Klingon. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Plus, another team is reportedly interested in Patrick Williams if he does hit restricted free agency, which could cause the Bulls a little bit more problems as Patrick Williams has more and more suitors. And we're going to talk about why this offseason's goal may not be about improving the win total next season. I think a lot of Bulls fans are kind of hoping the Bulls can achieve everything. And we'll point out why that's not likely. We're going to get to all that plus a little bit of the mailbag right after this you are now tuned in to chicago bulls central your number one place for all chicago bulls news and content what's going on bulls fans welcome to another episode of chicago bulls central your number one spot for everything chicago bulls related i'm the host here hayes but more importantly you guys can follow the channel at Bull Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into this content for today, y'all. And so we're going to start right off with uh, more reports coming out. This one's from 24-7 Sports that the Bulls are still looking amongst the other teams to move up and get Donovan Klingon. Saying this, there are a couple of teams that are being very active trying to trade up uh, to draft the U- UConn big man. Memphis and Chicago in particular, I'm hearing, are making significant attempts to move up to a position where they can draft Klingon. We've talked a lot about Donovan Klingon and what he offers. It's a player with a really high floor uh, at the NBA level who you look at is probably going to be a solid rebounding, shot blocking, and can score a little bit, make some decisions out the pick and roll big. Also some solid three-point shooting there. Not great or anything like that, but you do look at him and saying that he could definitely be a guy that, uh, that, can, that can do those type of things for the Bulls. And it would make sense that the Bulls would have him on the board. I'm someone, though, that I don't necessarily think you have to trade up. I don't look at Donovan Klingon and think this is a guy where you want to give up a lot of assets to be able to draft when you have some, maybe even some centers with some some better overall center, uh, some better better overall potential that are coming down to it. Um, and then when you look at it as well, there's a chance that a really good center is going to drop to you. Us hearing that things like maybe Alexander Saar is not working out for the uh, for the Atlanta Hawks, right, which is going to push that back and get another player that many people look at can play center. Then you, then you look at some of the teams in there who don't need a center, right? The, the Rockets, the, the, the Spurs, even maybe even the Pistons. These are teams that don't necessarily need centers. When you add in the Charlotte uh, Hornets to that, you never know what the Hornets are going to do. They are the Hornets, but they may not need a center. So you're looking at possibly the first, time, the first team that needs a center on the board, maybe being the Portland Trailblazers there at number seven. So if the Bulls are looking to move up, if, it's, if it comes down to four or five spots to be able to get Klingon, Maybe they don't have to give up a whole hell of a lot for it, but I like Klingon. And, and that's the thing when, when having these type of conversations that I, I like to put a, a like to explain it in detail is that it's not that I dislike Klingon. It's not that I don't think Klingon is going to turn into a damn good NBA player. I really do think he is. He needs to work on the free throw shooting percentage as well. Uh, yeah, of course, he, he can play more minutes, but again, that UConn team kind of spreads out the minutes when it comes down to it. And I don't think he has like the 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 back the advanced back to the basket moves either as a center but you know when it comes down to it Klingon is somebody who can finish with either hand he can he can hit the three solidly right he projects to be that but he does score pretty well in the interior his off ball defense is really good he improved as a shot blocker uh from his uh freshman to sophomore year this is a guy who just he understood how to use his size and understood how to use his physical presence even more in his sophomore season and when people do that you, you like to think, hey, this development path is going to continue, right? He can get, he can finish off lobs, things like that, um, you know, those type of things. And so Donovan Klingon is a really good prospect, especially in a draft like this. Overall, though, I don't know. When you have players that are going to be like Khalil Ware, when you have those type of players that are still going to be there on the board more likely when the Bulls draft at 11, there's a chance of that, right? It, it, it makes you start looking at things a little bit differently. And also just hearing what the Bulls also may be prioritizing. You look at them working out Rob Dillingham and, and Terrence Shannon Jr. and kind of even being open to trading for Clint Capella. It may be that as much as Bulls fans are hoping that the Bulls draft a center in this draft, it could come down to maybe that's just not what the Bulls are looking to do is to draft a center in this draft. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that if and when it does, you know, come to pass on if the Bulls made the right or wrong decision by whatever position they decide to go after there. But we'd be remiss not to look at the tea leaves and what they're telling us that the Bulls very well may not look at the centers in this draft as ones that they want, maybe outside of Donovan Klingon. So we'll see what happens. I, I, like, like I said, 
Don't want to knock Donovan Klingon as a player. I actually like Donovan Klingon as a player. He's not one of the players that I would like to. And by the way, this is just a bone to pick as an aside, not its own topic. The Bulls fans that are seriously saying the Bulls should draft Bronny James to hope that LeBron James come here, you're part of the problem. You're literally as bad as Jerry Reinsdorf. If you're hoping that drafting Bronny James so LeBron can come and being 40 years old and all that's going to do is sell tickets, sell hope, sell dreams, and not really accomplish much, you're literally Jerry Reinsdorf. You should put a picture in Jerry Reinsdorf in your mirror and look at it every single morning and realize you are him. You are part of the problem. Like, that's just... That's literally one of the most asinine. Like, the Zach Eady people are one thing because Zach Eady, at least on the basketball court, brings at least you're looking at some of what the Bulls are missing. I think people are too zoomed in on him bringing things Vooch lacks and not looking at what he brings overall to the game and how it could slow down things and things like that. But that's a, a conversation for another day. You Bronny James people, are, and especially just the ones that are like, draft Bronny so Bron can come you're idiot I'm, I'm, that's mean I'm trying to be nicer I'm trying to be a better person that was not nice but you need help you need to get serious help and you gotta you gotta you, you gotta you gotta work that out you gotta go see a therapist or something if that's if you're seriously sitting there and thinking yeah I got it this is what this is what the Bulls need this fix everything draft Bronny LeBron will come bam we're off to the races we're good to go Lay off the fentanyl. Like, y'all got to stop that. Y'all got to stop it. It's just, it's bad. It's just bad. Like, it, I, I've been a lot nicer this offseason. I've been, I've been trying to be not, because there's been a lot of crazy trade ideas and a lot of, and we're having fun. That's what this offseason is about. It's about speculation. We're thinking probably more than AK is. I love you guys. But you Bronny James people are, are just weird. It's just weird. Just weird. It, it's just odd. It's, it's, you're really odd and peculiar people. It's all I can say on that one. But with that said, uh, the Donovan Klingon thing, it brings about its own. Um, you know, if the Bulls do identify Donovan Klingon as the player that they think is their center for the future, I can't be mad at them being aggressive because we just haven't seen a front office that's been aggressive a lot. But then it comes down to what are you giving up? And then I would, again, it comes down to me being, I would not be surprised at all if Khalil Ware ends up being the better NBA center, right? I wouldn't be surprised at that. But you know, the Bulls are going to do what Bulls are going to do, and we'll see what comes out on the other side of that. But still hearing that the Chicago Bulls are considering moving up uh, for or not even considering that they are trying to find a path to move up to get Donovan Klingon doesn't necessarily surprise me. I guess it's just what are you willing to give up? And I guess that's what we'll see when it comes down to. But, hey, that's the kind of the update there on the draft. Uh, Ronnie James, people, y'all weird. But with that said, we also got another team now that could be interested in Patrick Williams. And this one comes from Matt Moore of the Action Network. And he says, the Hornets are known to be fans of Bulls free agent Patrick Williams. If they can retain Bridges in, if they can't retain Bridges in free agency. The Miles Bridges conversation has been an interesting one. We all know the story of the, everything and him making his way back to basketball, signing that one-year deal, being a, a free agent this offseason. Miles Bridges is a player that can go wherever he wants to go. And the Hornets being interested in Patrick Williams, considering it is a young team. They have a lot of young pieces that are still developing. Uh, you know, Patrick Williams is also from North Carolina. I wonder how much of this uh, factors into that to that rumor, right? But, you know, to hear that, that Patrick could be on their board, it does a couple of things, right? It tells us a couple of things is that when you hear the Thunder, you hear the Pistons, uh, and then now the, the Charlotte Hornets, these are all teams that have players with some talent on it right now we don't know if the Pistons after the new GM and ownership stepping in to fire a coach we don't know what their what their new focus is it could be completely different but I think that overarchingly is that Patrick Williams is going to have suitors and what that does is right now the Bulls have a lot of the leverage when it comes to Patrick Williams not only in if they extend the qualifying offer which they will do they can match any deal theoretically that Patrick Williams gets um Patrick Williams is also coming off a season that ended early due to uh, injury, and it wasn't necessarily the best season. Now, that December, I feel like he was starting to turn things around, and then he, start, he started getting banged up and, and it went back down after that. But right now, the Bulls hold the leverage. If Patrick Williams and his agent feel confident in their ability to sign the offer sheet that they want out in restricted free agency, that puts a little bit more of the power back in Patrick Williams and his agent's hands. And ultimately, when it comes down to it, is that that can make it the Bulls have to offer maybe a little bit more. Now, the Bulls also could look at a, a big offer sheet that Patrick Williams signs and says, hey, uh, yeah, we can't pay that. Peace off. Glad to, that you were here. Go out. Have a great career, Pat. Uh, you know, maybe you'll come back later. Uh, they could very well do that. Uh, but I think 
when it comes down is that the Bulls want to keep Patrick Williams. I don't know that's not what a lot of Bulls fans want to hear, and I get that, I understand it, but I don't think this Bulls front office is in a position where they are looking to move on from a 22-year-old player that was their first first round pick. And not to say that those things make or break it, but again, like I've, I've said many times, and Every fan base does this. Every single fan base does this. For example, look at how many Bulls fans. See, Dub got a whole video waxing poetic about Clint Capella possibly coming to the Chicago Bulls and how he changed the, the – my, my, my homie uses the word template too much, but he talks about how he can change the template of the center position for the Chicago Bulls. But Hawks fans have been over Clint Capella for like a season and a half at least, right? And it's when you when you are watching a player day in and day out, and of course you have hopes to that player – being and developing into what you hope for when they draft him fourth overall teams that are looking from the outside in are just looking at Patrick Williams and what he brings and he's a player that does bring a lot of defense that still has tremendous upside that the minimum is able to shoot the three ball and maybe they think hey we're going to actually run plays for Patrick Williams so we're going to get him even more three-point shots but Patrick Williams is going to have some interest anybody who thinks that Patrick Williams is just going to go out and and uh, because of the Bulls fans disappointment in him he's not going to have a deal and all oh, the bulls can re-sign him for cheap i keep hearing cheap 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 it could be a cheaper deal right and i think people forget is that one of the reasons why uh the bulls were able to re-sign io and kobe white for the deals that they were able to is that they didn't take meetings for other teams right they didn't even do that if patrick williams starts believe me kobe white regardless of how bulls fans felt about him at the offseason last year which has changed this year if Kobe White would have went into restricted free agency, he would have been able to get an offer sheet. How sizable that offer sheet is, yeah, maybe. But they took the, the the deal with the Bulls to stay here, get back in free agency earlier, and Kobe White bet on himself. Same with Io DeSumo. So it comes down to that. Um, and I think ultimately that Patrick Williams and how much interest he really has from other teams, it could put the Bulls in a weird position to where they either got to pay him more than they initially thought that they would want to, or they end up getting him signing an offer sheet that because of where they sit right now, luxury tax wise, that they're not able to match. And I think that's what it's going to come down to. Can the Bulls get him locked in beforehand? And uh, yeah, that's going to be something that the Bulls can get him locked in and him not even take meetings with other teams. They'll get him on a reasonable deal. If he takes meetings with other teams, it could be. I'm not saying for 100% fact, but it could get a little pricey for the Chicago Bulls in that space. And I know people are going to respond to this saying, well, let him walk. Patrick Williams, fourth overall pick. He's not. He's a bust. He's this. He's that. Guess what? The Bulls, I've always said this. Regardless of how Bulls fans feel about him, um, the end of the day is AK and Eversley don't see him in the way that a lot of Bulls fans do as far as negatively. And because of that, uh, Patrick Williams, they, they're probably going to try to lock in here sooner rather than later. And that brings me to my kind of last topic before we dive a little bit into the mailbag. You guys have been going off this week, so we may have at least one voicemail every day for the rest of the week, which tomorrow's Friday, so Saturday and Sunday are mailbag days anyway. But this, I've seen a lot of Bulls fans talk about when you hear Zach Levine trades, when you hear whatever trades, is that this doesn't make the Bulls better. We are not finding a player that's going to impact winning more than, than, uh, than Alice Caruso next season, so we shouldn't do that deal. And I need to come to this, and don't get me wrong, if the Bulls do make moves that improve the team and win total this year substantially, you, if you can find a way to do that, do that. Not every offseason is about adding wins to the total in the following season. It's about adding clarity to what you're doing. And I told you guys before, the Bulls, you guys are very much so going to probably be disappointed by whatever trade package we get for Zach Levine. Be prepared. The King and Murray guys, oh, we can't talk to the Kings unless we get King and Murray. We can't talk to the Pistons unless Cade's involved. We can't do, you're, you're, you're missing the point. That's not what Zach Levine's trade value is. And some, some trades aren't necessarily about making the team better in that moment. It's about adding clarity, assets, whatever, to make the team better in the future. And that is what it seems like. I can't say for certain because, hey, I could be absolutely wrong in this. The Bulls could be looking for a player that's going to get here, come change the Bulls, pair with Kobe White and, and Io DeSumo, and bam, we're off to the races. We're a 50-win basketball team. But some, some are about gaining assets. Some are about gaining young players. Some are about gaining clarity. Some are about creating, stepping, starting to create a path of being able to get to a place of winning, but that might not necessarily come in the next season. And again, the Bulls, if they do, if they do make a trade that doesn't necessarily improve the win total for the Bulls, considering they owe, they owe a top 10 pick, uh, well, they have a, a pick that's top 10 protected to the San Antonio Spurs in an extremely deep draft, 
that may not be the worst thing, worst possible outcome for the Bulls this season. Listen, I'm a Bulls fan, 37 years. I would love nothing more than for this team to make a move that I look at it and say at the end of it, we're, we're getting closer to being a championship contender. But some, unfortunately, sometimes you have to build things up over time. And part of what got the Bulls where they are right now is they went all in on something that just did not work. And when it started come cumberling down because of, the, of how those pieces fit, it was bad. The way that you build something sustainable over time is by drafting well. That's really the biggest thing. Now, some teams get lucky, and they're able because they're able, either worth location, money, or they already have a young player. They're able to have players come into the team that really help them be a championship contender right away. But a lot of teams, that's very rare on. Look at the success that the uh, teams, that some of the teams that made the biggest moves last offseason. Look at the Milwaukee Bucks. Look at the Phoenix Suns. Yeah, they have a much brighter outlook because of the talent they have right now for the Chicago Bull, than the Chicago Bulls. But those moves have just added a huge tax bill to them. And right now, they don't look like teams that are going to win titles. Now, that could very well change. The Bulls, to me, need to build something sustainable. And if they do make these moves that we've heard, it's about getting more assets to get more bites at the apple to then thus build something more sustainable than what they built. They built it on shaky knees. Zach Levine, Lonzo Ball, they went down. They built it on players that were already over 30. And Nikola Vucevic, DeMar DeRozan, which already limited your window. It basically said when you sign players or trade for players that are that, that much at the hill, right? They're not over the hill yet, but at the hill, that gives your window a very small opportunity and chance. Very small. But when you are, are drafting young players, that window is open. It's bright, right? You have a lot of time to be able to, to, uh, to, to benefit from that window. And the Bulls built a very small window. And as things start crashing down, now you're put in a position where you could possibly have to overpay for a 34-year-old player. And the most that you've seen is one playoff victory, one playoff game victory, and then a couple of play-in wins and ultimately not making the playoffs. So I just wanted to bring that up. I think that a lot of fans have it. I get it, and I understand it. This isn't knocking you guys at all of thinking, oh, well, the Bulls, if they're not making this move and it doesn't get them better, they should not do it. No, it's about sometimes it's about adding clarity. And the Zach Levine trade is a perfect example of that from what we're hearing that they're doing. Not necessarily saying that the Bulls are looking to bottom out, right? There's this area that you are in where you're not necessarily tanking, but you are clearing a path. And we'll see if that's what the Bulls do. That's what it feels like they're doing, but I could be very wrong on that. The Bulls can make a move that surprises all of us, which I would love to be able to say, and then maybe we're off to a different place. But let's see. Let's see what it's going to be. With that said, I want to get into these voicemails for today. This first one's from a first-time caller. This one's from Jay. Hey, what's good, Hayes? Uh, my name's Jay. This is my first time calling in. Um, and just wanted to say before I start, man, you do you you do great work, man. Uh, really represent the city well. Um, you and Pat are locked on, and then you at Chicago Bulls Central. Uh, we're really lucky to have you, but I'll, I'll dive right into it, man. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on what I see as the Chicago Bulls' priorities for the offseason. Um, there's there's one specific spot where I think I'm not as aligned with other Bulls fans, so I'm going to just jump right into them. Number one, draft Kalel Ware. I'm not even going to get into the why. You've already covered it. A lot of other people have already covered it, but I will restate it again. Number one is draft Kalel Ware. Number two, Resign P. Will. I think we're a little too hard on him. Six, seven, six, eight wings, three and D, versatile one, uh, can defend one through four, shoots 40% from three, and is only 22. We need to resign that kid. Number three, trade Roach. Number four, make a trade that gets us another pick this year. Number five, make a trade that gets us another pick next year in the 2025 stack draft. Number six, use the pick that we got this year to draft either Kyle Filipowski, which is preference. Uh, cause he's a little bit more playmaking forward or, or Tyler Smith. Um, and, and that trade kind of rounds out our front quarter of the future. Number seven, tra uh, sign and trade DeMar or just release him if there are no deals, but I expect there would be probably a couple of deals. And then finally, number eight, trade Zach Levine. Uh, that's where I really want to stop, right? Because, um, I think a lot of Bulls fans, if you ask them what the number one, um, Bulls' priority should be for the offseason. They'll say trade Zach Levine, and I think that's absolutely ridiculous. Now, to be clear, we do need to trade Zach Levine. That's why he's on the priority list. But to me, if we do all of those things before trading Zach Levine, and then at the end we don't, we haven't traded Zach Levine, it's still an, an exceptional Bulls offseason. Uh, Zach Levine is still a, a he's still a really good player, probably great on certain teams. Uh, he's just not good for this iteration of the Bulls. But keep in mind, 
we are currently rebuilding and changing this iteration of the bull. Kobe, Zach at the two, P. Will at the three, Filipowski at the four, Ware at the five. That probably would at least be good enough to raise and increase his trade value uh, on a team like that. So for me, you know, I'd like to move Zach, it, you know, it, it, but I'm not willing to pair Alex Caruso to do it. I'm not willing to uh, send our pick away to do it. I'm not willing to send any pick away to do it. I'm just not interested. So um, that, that's really where I land. Zach is like number eight. Uh, but appreciate all the things you do, man. Keep it up. I know this audio is going long. So I appreciate all you do, man. Good stuff. Talk so. All right, so I'm going to go through your Bulls priority list one by one. Draft Khalil Ware. I agree with that. I love Khalil Ware. He's become one of my favorite uh, center prospects in this draft for the Chicago Bulls. Resign P. Will. I think that I've already talked about that here in this in the second segment. I think that that's a foregone conclusion. I think they're going to resign P. Will. Trade Vooch. That's where it gets a little bit more difficult. I get why you have that on your priority list because yeah, it could make some sense. But with where Vooch is, where did, and this and people act like Vooch's production is terrible. It's not. Much like I said with the Patrick Williams, I do think that other teams could look at Nikola Vucevic and say, hey, he could definitely help this team, but because of the perception and things around it, the Bulls will probably have to give up an asset. I don't think they're going to be able to trade Vooch this offseason. That's just kind of my inkling right now. I would much rather bet on them not doing it and be surprised if they do, because I think if they just came into this offseason absolutely focused on trading Vooch, they would have to give up future assets to do it or attach a Alice Caruso to a Vooch trade, and then maybe you're not getting back as many assets for that because they're looking at Vooch as, as hey, th- you're sending us a piece that you don't want anymore. So we'll see what happens with that one. Get get another pick in this year and next year's draft. See, this is where we start getting into, like, the 2K. I under, I'm saying that I understand in real life why you would want it, but it's not that easy, right? Especially when teams are looking at this draft and saying, hey, this isn't this isn't the strongest draft. Yeah, you could probably get an additional pick this year, but next year, teams are going to be more protective over next year's picks because next year is a deep draft. In the 20s, you can get a prospect that is probably going to go in the top 12 in this draft, so that may become a little bit harder. Now, as far as Tyler Smith or Kyle Filiposki, Filiposki is a center. I, I hate when I hear people trying to make him a power forward just because he can dribble and shoot the three a little bit. There's like, oh, well, bam, Kyle Filiposki can be a power forward, and he will get cooked on the perimeter by most power forwards, period. So, no, Kyle Filiposki is not the center, the power forward that I want next to Khalil Ware. Tyler Smith, different conversation there. But Tyler Smith is, he's one of those prospects that I came into this draft extremely high on. But I do think that uh, ultimately uh, he's going to go later. And if you can get a, if you can walk away from this draft with Khalil Ware and Tyler Smith, you did damn good. But I also think that in some ways the Bulls are looking at wings. And that's kind of what we've been told. I think if they get an additional pick, wing is probably going to be the pick there. Sign in training DeMar DeRozan. Now, that it sounds great. And maybe the Bulls can force a, or not force, but can get the benefit of a sign in trade. But the problem is, you're not going to get much back in a sign in trade for DeMar DeRozan. Maybe a couple of seconds. I get it. You're adding assets at that point, but you're not getting a whole hell of a lot back for DeMar DeRozan unless the team that's signing him is over the salary cap and just does not have the space to sign him outright. We'll see on that one. Lastly, trade Levine. Now, I get what you're saying is that if all those things happen and you don't trade Levine, it's possibly not bad. I disagree with that because at the end of the day, this team has already said that relationship is done. And while I do think Zach Levine's a professional, I think that you have a higher chance than not of hurting Zach Levine's trade value further if you don't go ahead and move him. Yeah, there's a chance that it increases. But like I've gone over before in many episodes, I think there are more situations and outcomes that you hurt Zach Levine's long-term trade value than help it if he's still on the roster at the end of this year. That's just my personal opinion, and I don't think that it, we're going to get into a world where they look to keep Zach long-term. Now, if I thought that that was a possibility, then maybe my view on it would be a little bit different, but I just don't think that. But great voicemail, Jay. Great first voicemail. It may have been the greatest first voicemail other than from Vaughn that we've ever had. Maybe. Maybe. All right, let's get into the next voicemail. This one's from Troy. G'day, how is it? You got Troy here from the whole lot of Bull podcast, mate. Hey, I just want to pose the same question I asked uh, the guys on the CSGO podcast with their diehard um, mailbag episode that they did. Uh, So, Hayes, in your opinion, what needs to happen on draft night for the Chicago Bulls in order for you to feel like they walked away in a Bulls-related way winners from the draft and uh, where that becomes... Uh, with a Zach Levine trade, um, as I asked the guys at CSGO, whether it was we trade Alex Caruso. Um, obviously now, you know, with the news has come out this morning that um, from Will Gottlieb that the Bulls have rejected uh, 
uh, trade offers, uh, including our top ten pick to Alex Caruso because you know uh, Jerry Reinsdorf has man- made it a mandate that they made the playoffs. So I'm guessing that passed out the window now. Um, but yeah, outside of Alex Caruso, you know what needs to happen on draft night for you to walk away feeling like the Bulls had a win. Thanks, mate. Look forward to hearing from you. Go Bulls! All right, what needs to happen for the Bulls to be winners on draft night? I'll say this: have a clear direction. That's all. At this point, that's all I want. That that would make the Bulls winners. Is that now you've made our direction clear? You've gone young. You you've or you've added assets that are going to help us. That look like they're going to help us win now. Absolutely right. At get a path. Yes, I have my players that I like that I love. Khalil Ware, Tajon Saloon, Mattis Busilis. Those are the three players that if the Bulls find a way to draft those guys, it's automatically going to be a win for me because those are some of my favorite players in this draft with Terrence Shannon Jr. trailing a little bit behind them. That's going to make them a personal winner for me. But overarchingly, what would make the, the Bulls draft night a, win, a winner for me is that adding a, a direction for your team. No longer sitting in this purgatory where you're trying to compete and develop and you're not doing either one very well, right? And, I'm, and that's a lot to ask on one draft night, but teams have done it before. Hell, the Bulls did it before when they traded Jimmy Butler on draft night. If you can add clarity and a clear path to this team while picking up talent, whether the talent is right now talent or it's, it's, uh, it's talent that overall, like you're looking at the potential there, but the high, high, high floor, those are things that I'm looking at in this draft that would make the Bulls draft night winners for me personally. And we'll see what comes about it. But great voicemail there from Troy. Always love it when Troy uh, sends voicemail. Send, send more in. I want to hear from you more, Troy. We don't get to talk as much because I just haven't been on, on Twitter as much lately. But, uh, yeah, yeah, send in those voicemails. Uh, let's get into the last voicemail. This one's from Reginald. Hey, this is Reginald from Columbus, Georgia. Uh, but I heard about the Alex Caruso offer of a top 10 first round pick. My mind went into like acne fucking up again, but uh, apparently Jerry Jones, not Jerry Jones, but uh, Jerry Lyons is messing around. Acting like he's Jerry Jones getting involved in the uh, management of the company, not company, but the team. And I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. And I think I have to agree with that. You've got to make it a positive uh, AK because I don't see how you can build a consistently winning team what he's got to work with. You got Ryan Dorf, uh, 86 straight deals. You got Billy Donovan struggling to develop young talent on the floor. So even if you do draft all good, you know, the best option for their continued development go somewhere else. We've seen this happen a couple of times. So at this point, I don't really know how to build become successful. And I mean, if you have an idea of what the Bulls could do, I would like to hear it, but right now, I'm looking at the cost people. The only thing I can see is the Bulls probably, like, deciding Devontae Green, drafting a big to play Summit, and probably re-signing Lee Will, maybe DeMar DeRozan. But right now, I I got little hope for them to make any base of the The only possible positive to that situation or that scenario is that Bulls of Prowlers will definitely be a lot of receivers. They'll probably be having to pick in the top ten. To see if the Bulls might have a point point five first round pick, but you know who knows if that's going to be a hit or miss. So, what's your opinion? Um, okay, Reggie. Um, I get a lot of what you're saying in this. Like, don't get me wrong, but I won't say that there's just it, it's saying autom- automatically that there's nothing that the Bulls can do. I think that um, don't let the rumors, sometimes those rumors are just that, right? Even Casey Johnson has come back out and said that he hasn't heard anything about ownership stepping in. Um, and not to say that Casey or anybody knows everything that happens behind closed doors with the Chicago Bulls. I'm just saying, let's, let's not take things as like true. And ultimately it comes down to this. There have been teams with a lot bleaker outlook in the Chicago Bulls that have been able to turn it around. So I think right now, overall, it's about, I, I understand not having much hope for this front office because they haven't given us much reason for it. And like I've said many times for me personally, this is kind of the last offseason where I'm given a benefit of a doubt. Let's hope that some some clarity does come for this team over the over the course of this offseason. And if it does, we'll turn it around. But, you know, we'll see what happens with it. I think that th- there's talent in this draft. You don't have to pick in the top 10 for the tra- talent to be there. Um, but I think ultimately my plan, you asked what like what, what what's your plan? Like, I, I think the Bulls just have to have a plan first. And we've been a team that seems like we haven't we've ha- we had an initial plan and then we haven't really rebounded from that plan. And everything we've done since then is trying to keep as much as that plan together as possible. We got to forge a new plan. It's time for a new plan. It's time for a new path. 
And I think that that's what I would love to see the Chicago Bulls do more than anything in this offseason. But you guys can let me know, as always, what you guys think down below. But, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you guys are following the show at Bulls Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns. BullsCentralPod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We're the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. That's thanks to you guys. And like I like to end every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See right if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of The Breaks Break Media. 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 Media.